Hello, and welcome back to my Launch Complexes dev stream of RP1, where uh, last night redesigned my uh, circumlunar Gemini spacecraft to be a lunar orbital Gemini spacecraft. Check one thing here. Yes, it does have two crew aboard, so the Delta V should be correct for two crew. So you're playing on Discord, so yes. Yep. Uh, you must be yep. Uh, and I had Discord open because I was popping in dev chat. Uh, although Squirrel was also asking me, and Squirrel will see that I'm live at some point. Um, apparently the About Me section of my Twitch stream was still linking to RP1 hard mode. Oh well. <laughs> I think it's the fine. requirements to follow what you're actually doing from stream to stream means that we would have had to figure it out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and each of the VODs in the YouTube uh, uploads have the right links. But. So... This all seems fine. Um... So I have eight billion dollars just sitting in the bank. I probably should start spending that. I mean, I'd probably just keep a lot of my eight billion dollars in the bank if I had it. I That's mean, yeah. yes. That's that's a fair point. Um, no, that was a joke point. Like, yeah, you probably should. But, spend it. <laughs> but it is also definitely true. Uh, at that point, you have the bank, rather than. All right. Yeah, I suppose so. I, w I would, I would probably just waste money on starting my own game company, and you know, flounder. I'm sure, since I'm not a not a good business person, but it would be fun. Yeah, but you can hire business people. That's true. Except that they I would. Know. Except you'd either have to listen to them and not do what you wanted, or do what you wanted and not listen to them. So. Yeah. Or uh, be good at hiring people that aren't gonna like kind of run away with the money, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, although Probably. I think in the, in the games industry, listening to the business people to only a limited degree is probably the best strategy. Uh, all that, I mean, yes, also that. Uh it's so hard to hire people. I don't want to. I don't want to sacrifice my efficiency. I'm in a sort of mm. weird position where, right now, I have only a little over half the workers that I could have in this launch complex. But if I fill it all the way, um, I will crater my efficiency. Which, so like that's actually probably worth cons considering whether we want to do that, or whether whether that's actually the mechanic we want there or not. Because it does so, make expansion feel very bad. So if you if you if you've got half the people in there and you filled it up to max, then yeah, I could take a I could take a between <laughs> LC efficiency and global, I could take a half. I you know yeah. that could go 
anything over half and I'd still be net positive, except it will also crater the build rate in all my other launch complexes is the problem. I mean, it should always be a net positive if you're assuming that the workers that are still there are just as efficient as they were before and the new ones coming in are not 0% efficient. Right, but the problem, the problem is that that's not how it works with the simplifying assumptions of the math. Ah, well then, fix the math. Well, unless, like, unless you switch to a... Unless you do something granular where you actually have to have classes of workers, no, no, you don't even have to do that. I mean, what what are you assuming these new workers are coming in as? What efficiency are they? Fifty percent. Fifty percent. So yeah, I mean, if you if you are half full and then you add, you know, double up, you should be at seventy five percent efficiency, right? No, no, no. But the point is, there's both launch complex efficiency and global efficiency. Okay. Oh, so there there's a double dipping effect. Mm -hmm. Because like adding adding new engineers will lower the global efficiency. Yes, I can see how that would yield potentially net negatives on adding mm -hmm. engineers, but and that feels like it needs to be just fixed to the math that the efficiencies are multiplying in such a, a fashion that creates a negative feedback loop for adding more people. At least I mean, temporarily. if if you slowly feed people in, it's not bad. Like I've been I've been keeping at about ninety percent global efficiency by slowly feeding people in. And the more people I feed in, the easier it is to feed in new people because you know it's a smaller dilution each time. Yeah. Like that's not that's not the worst gameplay mechanic. Yeah, I mean, like part of it is very intentionally a break on expansion. But it does have that unintended side effect of scaling up is hard, and it and it it negatively, like there is the sort of counterintuitive thing of like, you you hired a guy to work in Launch Complex Thirty Four, and. Uh, he's making the people over in Launch Complex 17 work slower. Mm -hmm. And that feels kind of weird. Yeah, that is kind of On weird. the other hand, it is like the point of global efficiency, it is it is modeling the idea of uh, you have... Like, it's it's a simpler version of the workers can be in a number of skill levels, and they gradually skill up over time without, without having to... Um, deal at all with those independent skill levels, like, discreetly. Yeah. Yeah, so that takes that takes some thinking. I mean, it's clearly just the quadratic effect of having launch complex efficiency and global efficiency, but uh... I mean, it's not like imagine if you only had global efficiency. It's not a symptom of the quadratic effect. It's a symptom of the fact that you're that it, efficiency is trying to do two things, right? It's it's trying to model how efficient this worker is at the actual launch complex and what they're doing there. And it's also trying to model the skill level of all the workers in your space program. No, I mean, um, so even if you, if there was not, a, so if there was not a quadratic effect, yes, that your launch, your example of launch complex 17 slowing down um, still ha pertains. But the additional speed you get in Launch Complex 34 
um, more than makes up for the fact that Launch Seven Complex Seventeen slowed down. Like if you if you look at net, you know, like how much engineering output you have yes. across your entire space program. But if there's a multiplicative effect, there's you know, like yep. uh, then then you know, like it could be globally also you slowed down. Yep. At least you know, like until you rebuild your efficiency. Yes. Hey, squirrel. Yeah, so squirrel, if you if you built your own service module and you put batteries in that service module, that's going to be stupid heavy. And since you have fuel cells, you shouldn't have done that. And that would probably explain some of your mass problems because that'll drastically increase your dry mass, which will then increase uh, how much propellant you need to carry to get your early 2 km sec. Why would you put in a bunch of batteries if you have fuel cells? Are you assuming that they might break? I don't know. I mean, the, the Gemini equipment section has a lot of batteries because... Uh, historically, the initial versions didn't have fuel cells, so they lasted the early missions on batteries alone. They didn't take the batteries out once they added fuel cells? Uh, they did, but uh, we only have one part. So the way we model that is we have the the maximum battery capacity of the huge batteries and also the fuel cells. Gotcha. Yeah, Squirrel, my guess is you're carrying another, like, 100 kilograms or more of dry mass that you don't need to be carrying, and that will have drastically inflated the mass of your entire spacecraft. Yeah, also, last I checked, especially with uh, static parts like that, we didn't enforce the mass cost of batteries too well uh we don't yeah i kirk was going through and fixing it some but um we okay. presently yes it's free to add batteries to the gemini service module even though it shouldn't be Hey, Pap. Hey, Pap. Oh, right. I am. Um, can get that. And... Let's check out ye old lunar launch window set. Oh, and I think check. I think there was a pin. On somewhere in here. Channel I thought was Doesn't seem to be pinned anymore. That's weird. Literal or figurative ton squirrel? Uh, Pap, so the... Uh, needs is not required 
but is good practice in that case because when module manager starts it will go through all patches with needs and discard them if the needs are unmet which means then that patch will never try to run in the patching process which will uh, slightly decrease the time it takes to patch in the case where um, where that you don't have the requisite mod but like in the grand scheme of things it doesn't really matter yeah I could have sworn in the Principia channel there was a pin about um, other ways to go to the moon and like with a cannon what other ways are there I mean, other than uh, than just you know not waiting for a, a node, but I'll just do it the node style. Uh, it's the sixth of February, nineteen sixty-six. You mean like a Baikonur style launch to the moon? Uh no, that was also done in a lunar launch window. I'm talking about a daily lunar launch window rather than a bi than a semi-monthly lunar launch window. Gotcha. Like, there's a KOS script that does it, but I wanna, I don't want to install KOS, so I want an offline calculator to figure it out for me. Uh, so, shoot, it's already less than three days. So our our alternative is to launch on the twentieth of February. Oh, we haven't finished rolling out yet, so obviously we're going to miss this window. Yeah, Squirrel, if you're if you're just going to lunar orbit, you really don't need a bunch of RCS. Especially if you use fine controls and manually do most of the turning. Okay, so we're going to go to the pad on the 19th of February. Third. Yeah, okay. Let's do it. Okay, this setup is forecasters. Okay, it's two seven nine. Eighteen hours. 
Let's see what direction the land is going. Down. Okay, and also I need to check one other thing, which is how much do we precess in a half hour? The answer to that question is we go from 297 40 to 97.35. So point oh six decreases by point oh six and a half hour. So going to that land is actually probably fine. Because over the three days it takes to get there. We'll be fine. Uh, now let me figure out my turn shape. Uh, that looks, I think, correct. And I think I want to end up in a broadly equatorial orbit. But not quite. Such that we're not stuck behind the moon. Alright. Let's do it. 15 hours from now. Fifteen hours from now is uh, just after 1 a.m. on the 23rd. So yeah, it'll be a slightly fast transfer, but not too fast. Okay, just after sunset. Oh, I guess I underlofted. We'll see what our max Q is. Yeah, I definitely underloft it. Ouch. It's not like we lack for Delta V, though. We 
exit on the next launch. It's one of the things about RP-1 that doesn't simulate reality very well. That, uh... No, sometimes it's true. Like, mm -hmm. if you're launching a science mission, you always want to use up as much of your mass budget as you can. You always find some other experiment to pack on there or something like that. And in RP-1, that's often not true. Like, especially with launch complexes giving you booster families Oftentimes yep. you'll just be like, oh, I got, you know, spare Delta V because I can't really put anything else on here. Yep. I mean, yeah, broadly, although I feel like in reality, the, so part of that, like part of that is the distorting reality of these days where the flight rate is so low. Um, in distinction to, say, the early 60s, where the flight rate was high enough that you just um, used an off-the-shelf satellite bus, basically. Uh, but yeah, I think in the main, there was there was always there's always more science to be done, and therefore always more instruments you can put on. And we don't we have fairly limited instruments, and also we don't at all model the fact that um, it's not. Like, it's not the case that a Geiger counter weighs however many kilograms. It's that, you know, the more mass budget you dedicate to your Geiger counter, the better it is. I'm surprised you didn't break out into the portal theme song there for a sec. There's always more science to be done. <laughs> True. Yeah, it's yeah. been a few days since they played that over, over the, the bathroom radio station. <laughs> is, that, is that that must be a heck of an earworm then there uh, it's played every once in a while what was great was uh, I knew the day that we shipped Counter Strike's Battle Royale mode which we ended up calling Danger Zone because hmm. King Logan's Danger Zone was on repeat <laughs> and it's like okay well I guess we shipped it <laughs> I've just been thinking about Archer all day long or Top Gun now I guess yeah Yeah, I seem basically like I I, I always build these uh, long time to orbit launch vehicles, where I probably be better off using like fast burning Carolox. At least in terms of build rate, like not sure I'd be better off in terms of cost given. A larger number of engineers, or I guess I could use a larger launch complex but not fully staff it. Are somebody who uh, approaches every problem as how can I make a centaur do this? <laughs> I mean, it's a it's just, it, like, it turns out that 
most probes are about the right size for a centaur boosted by something in the range between an atlas and a three-engine Titan II. I mean, yes, the Centaur gives you great C3, and therefore most probes do benefit from something that is Centaur-like. But, I mean, your, your, your Gemini program is also on a Centaur. Because, similarly, I need the I need the C3 for going beyond low Earth orbit. I mean, it's worth remembering that the N1 was heavier than Saturn V with a third of the TLI payload. Because specific impulse is king. Oh, I don't actually need to do that. I uh, add a maneuver, set this to five days, MEO thirty one forty. Now let's refine. Is the N1 was that bad? I mean, J2s are good, but they're not that much better than NK 15Vs. Yeah, they are. So, N1 had much worse um, propellant mass fraction in its tanks. Yeah, yeah. So, that not was that. some of it. Okay, this is coming in with higher inclination than I expected it to. Four days and ten hours. Four days. Okay. And it's... Yeah, okay, so we actually do need a little faster transit to fix that. Okay, that's getting better. Three days and 21 hours is pretty close to correct. There, that's fine. Um... I just want the... very Celine near the node. 
Uh, and that's coming in the wrong way. That's fine. So we'll go back to side. Not quite. Get there, get there, get there. Uh, squirrel, why do you have to, why do you have to go around one full orbit before you can do the TLI for the the J two relight period? I guess. Okay, this, I really should stop messing around with this. This is going to be fine. And the actual burn we'll get will be somewhat different anyway. <laughs> That's reasonable alignment. Night, Pap. Thanks for coming by. And Night, Pap. Squirrel, Night. you might actually, you might consider instead of doing it that way, put like some. Oh, I get no. 
wonder whether you might do better to actually have a small stage for TLI that the core puts into orbit rather than trying to do TLI on that stage. It'll raise the cost a little bit, but it'll make your life small easier. Stage. Small stage, would it happen to be powered by RL-10s? No, because <laughs> I'm kidding. Don't worry that's about it. fairly expensive. I, w I was thinking something probably an X405. Which incidentally has about the thrust of two RL-10s. If memory serves. Hey, Alex. What's so bad about having to go around? Boil off. Boil off. Squirrel, no, you're doing it with the X405, like I said. Basically do it area and five style with a solid booster as a hydrolux core and then uh, a non hydrolux upper stage. I hate that stutter on autosave where it freezes and then no for the TLI and then you use your your existing service module basically flip the script so you have a hydrolox core and then a non hydrolox second stage instead of the other way around I mean, no, it's probably not lighter and simpler than the Titan variant. It's just um, if you want to start having the the J2 stage anyway. You could try simulating what spaceship does with internal reserve tanks. So you could make a cylindrical uh, tank with a hole in it and then another cylindrical tank inside of it, and then the internal tank can have some MLI if you really care that much about boil-off. Because the internal tank won't yeah. be exposed to yep. the atmosphere going up and blow up, get blown up from that. Okay, that's looking good. Let's shake off the stage. Deploy the solars. Deploy the antennas. And uh, which one is this? 27 dBi, and this is set to UHF. Yeah, and this is S band. Yes. Okay, sweet. Now, make 
make sure everything's engaged. One orbit's worth of precession, not predictable enough to account for it. Real question. I, I mean, I don't play Principia, so I don't know. I'm sure it's calculable, but it's probably not... It's... Analytically calculable, like yeah. orbit once, see how much the land changed. Is yeah. that you know like is that the line always going to change like that? Uh definitionally it is yes. Because you're always launching from a fixed place, which means your initial orbital track, given the same inclination and uh, apogee and perigee, is going to have exactly the same precession. Yeah, I'd have thought so, but you know, like yep, I don't know. that's what I'm asking, squirrel. Yeah. Okay, so with these, I need to target the moon. Target the moon with this one as well. Okay. completely lost track of what mission you're doing. Uh, I'm sending up a lunar com relay that will also do a bunch of lunar science. Cool. Uh, and let me quick check. What is the... F uh, 27 degrees we want for a frozen orbit. And that looks like it's about 23 degrees. So... It's probably fine. Let's add a maneuver. It's in three days, 14 hours. Okay. Inclination is too low. Yeah, it is the 20 degrees that I thought it would be. So we will definitely need to increase our inclination. Seventeen eighty. Okay. Now let's see what it thinks. 27. Okay. 
Except actually I don't want that at all. Let's look at a UHF relay. That's S band. So let's look at the UHF one. Antenna planning. No connection, so we need a lower orbit than that. Okay, so we want about 11. Good enough. Okay. Seems fine. Oh, I think I was going to actually... Yeah, I have enough delta V to capture all the way down to low orbit and then go up again. So I'm going to going to do that thing. For the science? Yep. Because we're not building a lander yet. Um, so I think what I'm going to want to do is minimally capture. Okay. 
and then try to get the AN as near things as possible. So I can go to polar and then reduce. Yeah, that's ch that's cheap plane change. So that's fine. Good enough. It's still, we don't lack for delta V, so I'll just do that. Okay. Oh, will this tell me what my... Yes, 104 meters per second at Apocelline. So yeah, we probably don't even need to do that there. We can just alter our plane right at Apocelline, given how cheap it all is. Sorry, Alex Hudson, what do you mean? I'll crash into the moon if anything goes wrong. Oh, I see what you mean, yes. My capture is putting me on a crash course. Yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and... Oh, that's weird. Why is it not... That's very confusing. In MCI, so it's not a reference frame, not a reference frame problem. What periaps is already capturing it? 100 kilometers. It's not bad. Hmm. Yeah, frankly, I don't understand what's going on here. I Are assume it's because... Yeah, that's what I was thinking it too, Alex. Yep, exactly. That's what I was starting to say, that it, it's too light of a capture. All right, let's capture a little better. All right, so that costs a little more, but it's okay.
You know what? I am just going to do this super lightly and then correct later. But either way, that's a problem for another night. I'm pretty zonked, so I think I'm going to call it quits here. Next one, thank you for joining, and thank you everyone watching. I will catch you next time. Night. Hey, good night. Talk to you later.